finally happened, I can hear you say. Adam Pajiti and Cultaholic have lost their minds. Well, my fair-weathered friend, I'm here to tell you that not only did that happen a long time ago, but that watching, critiquing, and then ranking every Vince McMahon match that ever happened is probably the most sane thing I've done. You see, while you, an amateur, probably watches wrestling hoping to see a bunch of cool moves and gymnastics performed by a bunch of young, ludicrously talented super athletes, I, an actual wrestling expert, watch this great sport for the drama, spectacle, and yes, the big, beautiful muscles. And who provides that more than the owner of the world's biggest wrestling empire? Who is in charge of running a publicly traded multi-billion dollar organization, but still finds time to slap on a year's worth of fake bake, push himself in the gym, and then walk out on global television to be manhandled and humiliated for our pleasure? The in-ring career of Vince McMahon spanned from 1998 to 2012, and in that time, he had what I would call 52 proper matches. That is, matches that were actually wrestling matches, and not matches that were announced as such and then basically turned into straight-up angles, as tended to happen every now and again. He's worked against the Flairs, Austins, Hogans, Hearts, and Triple Hs of this world, as well as his own flesh and blood, in cages and in street fights, with titles on the line, and in pay-per-view main events. He has as much natural athletic ability as a concrete sloth, and he usually moves as gracefully as a pissed-up builder dancing at his daughter's wedding. But he's brilliant, and his matches are so oddly captivating that I could watch, say, oh, I don't know, 52 of them. Which I did, because everything is absolutely fine. Don't worry about it. I'm Adam Pachiti from Cultaholic.com, and this is every Vince McMahon match ranked from worst to best. Join me, and may God have mercy on us all. Number 52, with Drew McIntyre, Jack Swagger, Vladimir Kozlov, and Mark Henry versus John Cena. In preparation for his match with Bret Hart at WrestleMania 26, Vince laid down the gauntlet for John Cena, who had been friendly with the Hitman in recent weeks. Teaming up with the Chosen One, the All-American American, the Moscow Mauler, and the World's Strongest Man in a series of handicap matches, Vince barely got involved in the action, smartly leaving it to his partners to carry the load. Cena, pretty adept at this point when it comes to rising above hate, never once looked like he was going to give up as he battled valiantly, only succumbing when his mania opponent, Batista, ran in and nailed a Batista bomb. Vince picked up the win, having not landed or received a single offensive move in the whole match. That is what you call working smart, not hard, kids. More of an angle than an actual match, and trust me, that will be a theme during our countdown, this did a good job of building anticipation for the showdown between the animal and big match John, but considering Vince's very limited involvement, it ranks at the bottom of the pile here. Number 51 versus Shane McMahon. Ah, now this is more like it. Who doesn't love to watch a father batter his son? Shane challenged his old man to a fight earlier in the show, with a reluctant Vince turning down the chance to spark out his firstborn. A couple of sordid revelations and a beatdown by the corporate ministry later, and the owner of the company had changed his mind and the match was on. Not long before the match, Vince had been beaten down again and was found lying on the ground backstage, another one of those wonderful Russo trademarks we all love to loathe. Coming into the match, the worse for wear, he literally fell down the ramp while making his entrance. Vince took a clothesline and a bronco buster before rallying with a clothesline of his own, followed by a stunner for the win in all of about 90 seconds. Again, more angle than proper match, father and son would have much better and more memorable matches in the years to come. Number 50 versus Triple H. From the son to the son-in-law, Vince was tangling with Triple H on the October 1st, 2007 episode of Raw. There was no major issue between the pair at the time, perhaps the game beat Vince at Pictionary during the weekend's evening social, or lifted a heavier weight during a late night session in the corporate gym. No, this one served as a backdrop for another rivalry. This time it was the feud between Triple H and Umaga, who was set to clash at the upcoming Cyber Sunday pay-per-view. Not much as a match, of course. This was mainly Vince stalling and trying to utilize the special guest referee Carlito for an unfair advantage. Didn't work out too well though, since there was only so long that Vince could run for before Stephanie's husband caught up with him, unloading with punches and smashing his head off the announce desk. A backstabber and attempted quick count didn't work for Vince, and the match came to an abrupt end when Triple H was DQ'd for striking the rather cool official. The Samoan bulldozer showed up for the post-match beatdown. 
Number 49 with Steve Austin versus Chris Benoit and Chris Jericho. Hell had frozen over and Vince McMahon and Steve Austin were now aligned, teaming up to take on the WWE Tag Team Champions, Chris's Jericho and Benoit. It hadn't been long since the Canadian lads had won the titles from Austin and Triple H in the match where the King of Kings famously tore his quad, so revenge was definitely on the mind of the enemies come business partners here. This being a Vince McMahon match, it was not straightforward. The chairman of the board had the rabid Wolverine and Y2J compete in two non-title matches before their scheduled title defense, having to get past the very burly teams of the APA and Big Show and Rhino. Passing the test by winning, but coming out of it pretty battered and bruised, the table was set for Austin and McMahon to pick the bones and walk out as the new champions. Our hero was plenty physical here, getting some shots in and taking a crippler crossface and walls of Jericho for his troubles. A short match, it ended when Ben managed to roll up Austin while pulling the tights, giving us a great shot of the bionic butt crack in the process. Not a great Vince match or angle, but definitely a thing that happened. Number 48 with Triple H and Shawn Michaels vs Legacy For Vince's 63rd birthday, he was given the gift of a match with Randy Orton, Cody Rhodes and Ted DiBiase Jr. For my birthday, I usually get a fiver from my grandma and a case of Tesco Lager, but I guess a match with Legacy is fine too. Teaming with Triple H and Shawn Michaels, McMahon did absolutely nothing in the match apart from stepping in the ring to get the pin on the legend killer after some interference from John Cena. Many happy returns. Number 47 with Trish Stratus versus William Regal and Stephanie McMahon. One of the great things about being the owner of the company is that you can book yourself in a storyline where you get to make out with a drop dead gorgeous former fitness model in front of your storyline catatonic wheelchair bound wife. Admit it, you'd do the exact same thing, right? Right? Yes, the Vince McMahon and Trish Stratus love affair was one for the ages and led to a match between Trish and Steph at No Way Out 2001. A shockingly good scrap, Trish won thanks to a run-in from a confused and conflicted Commissioner Regal, which led to this tag match here the next night on Raw. Another short one, this was more storyline advancement as Vince seemingly turned on Trish in favor of his daughter, with everyone ganging up to cover the three-time WWE Babe of the Year in the rancid contents of a slot bucket. We're only one week away from Vince forcing Trish to undress and bark like a dog in the middle of the ring, folks. Number 46 with Shane McMahon and Umaga versus Rob Van Dam. Another one where Vince McMahon was instructed to do nothing more than come in for the match winning pin, this time he's getting a victory over Rob Van Dam. As part of his crusade against Bobby Lashley, Vince McMahon captured the ECW title, angering the likes of RVD who had given their blood, sweat and tears to build up the brand, only for a pensioner in a do-rag to walk around holding its main prize. While I'm naturally curious about seeing the athletically gifted whole effing show square off with one of the most uncoordinated men in history, this handicap match sadly didn't provide it. Instead, it was Van Dam fighting the numbers game and eventually yielding to it, ending with Vince trolling the remaining fans of Philadelphia's favorite fallen promotion. Number 45 with Shane McMahon and Umaga versus Robbie Brookside. At number 45, we have more fun from the spring of 2007 as WWE rolled into London for an episode of Raw most famous for the scintillating one hour main event between Shawn Michaels and John Cena. Kicking off the show, however, was current NXT trainer Robbie Brookside taking on Shane McMahon, Umaga, and finally Vince McMahon. Not bothering with the pretense of even putting on his usual ring gear, Vince sauntered out after the Liverpool lad had taken a proper kicking and strode into the ring to add another easy W to his wrestling resume. So why does this one rank higher to other similar entries on the list? I'd love to tell you differently, but it's absolutely down to the hat that Vince McMahon is wearing in a bid to conceal the Kojak cut given to him by WWE Hall of Famer Donald Trump. Two stars for the match, this one flirts with four star territory thanks to that fancy fedora. Ooh. Number 44 versus Midian. Usually this would rank dead last because Midian is the absolute dirt worst, but given the fact that Vince actually does a bit of wrestling here, and I use that term loosely, it has to rank above some of the previous entries where Vince did none of the work but got all of that sweet, sweet glory. Taking place before the fateful Over the Edge pay-per-view, Vince McMahon and Midian headlined an episode of Sunday Night Heat, with Vince being a replacement for Steve Austin, scheduled to headline the pay-per-view later in the night, a match that McMahon's rotten son Shane had booked earlier. 
Shane, naturally, would be the special guest ref. Vince was fired up for the match and nailed a Lesnar-esque double takedown right from the jump, unloading a barrage of punches before Midian took over and threw the boss over the announce desk. More weak brawling ensued until Midian and other members of the corporate ministry injured Vince's ankle by placing it against the steel steps and cracking it with a chair. More a tease heading into the pay-per-view, this obviously didn't measure up as a match, but at least babyface Vince got a chance to show off some of his amateur stylings. Number 43, The Corporate Royal Rumble Oh dear, we're still in 1999, a year where every show was booked to fly by at roller coaster pace, but that on the whole felt longer than Randy Orton and Edge at WrestleMania 36. The main event of the January 11th edition of Raw was a corporate Royal Rumble, pitting members of the corporation and DX against one another, with the coveted number 30 spot in the actual Royal Rumble match on the line. After Billy Gunn, Kane, Test and the likes had been eliminated, it came down to Bossman against Triple H, with Vince entering the fray and eliminating both to seemingly win the match. The look on Vince's face after celebrating only to realize that China still hadn't participated and was coming out to kick his billion dollar backside was fantastic. That look of shock turned into a look of anger when Steve Austin made his entrance, distracting Vince long enough for the ninth wonder of the world to come in and dump him over the top rope, the greased up CEO almost decapitating himself on the bottom strand in the process. Number 42 with Shane McMahon and Umaga versus Bobby Lashley. Is there a sweeter sight in wrestling than Vince McMahon, do-rag on head and ECW title around his waist, power strutting his way to the ring to vanquish yet more inadequate opposition? Well, yes, lots of sweeter sights actually, but this whole period of Vince winning the ECW title and fighting off big boy Bob was underrated and Vince himself was a hoot, clearly reveling in the total ridiculousness of the situation. This was short and very much to the point, with Lashley taking out Umaga before decking Vince and Shane, and then hitting a power slam onto the fruit of Vince's loins, picking up the win and reclaiming the ECW title in no time at all. Or did he? A post-match attack by Umaga gave the genetic jackhammer a window in which to retrieve the title, cutting a promo to say that the victory and title switch didn't really count because he had pinned Shane and not himself. I mean, sure, why not? Number 41 with Steve Austin versus D'Lo Brown and The Rock. May 11th, 1998 now, and we're right in the middle of the hottest rivalry in all of wrestling, McMahon vs. Austin. Taking place as the main event of Raw, McMahon teamed himself up with his main adversary as a way to get inside the head of the Texas Rattlesnake, who was due to tangle with Vince's hand-picked would-be corporate champion, Dude Love, later in the month at Over the Edge. Obviously more of an angle than a meaningful match, this one did have some good action in it, thanks to the joint efforts of Rock and Austin, two blokes that have all right chemistry together, I suppose. Vince spent most of the match on the apron, glaring at Austin and doing his best to hinder his teammates in what was essentially a handicap match. Austin made his own comeback and cleaned house before Vince ran in with a lariat that would make Stan Hansen proud. Alright, it was actually a pretty not terrible clothesline actually, as the match descended into chaos and the show abruptly went off the air. Number 40 with Shane McMahon versus The Stooges Savage vs. Steamboat, Michaels vs. Undertaker, Styles vs. Cena, Vince and Shane McMahon vs. Gerald Briscoe and Pat Patterson is up there as far as Matt Classics go. A slice of pure attitude era pie, which is like regular pie but filled with bad words and half-naked women, this tag match is perhaps not one for the wrestling purist. Although I would suggest that if you are a wrestling purist watching a ranking video of Mr. McMahon matches, then perhaps you've taken a wrong turn somewhere and should return to New Japan World immediately. I would also suggest that if you don't at least smile at the Stooges coming out to Real American while mocking Hogan's iconic posing routine, then maybe this business just isn't for you, brother. A mercifully short match, this was all rolling around and punching and trying not to go arse over tit before Ken Shamrock and then the Mean Street Posse ran in and everything just sort of ended. It wasn't a good ending, but it was an ending, and sometimes that's all you can ask for. Number 39, Stone Cold runs the gauntlet. More Austin vs McMahon shenanigans here, with Stone Cold running the gauntlet against members of the corporation in the main event of the February 13th 1999 episode of Raw, which went down one night before the first proper Austin McMahon match at St Valentine's Day Massacre. 
In front of a massive crowd inside the Toronto Sky Dome, the bionic redneck went up against Ken Shamrock, Test, Kane, China, and Big Boss Man in a series of short matches that all ended when the next member of the corporation ran in, drawing the DQ each time. At the end of the Boss Man encounter, they all said sod it and lay a hurting on old Chili McFreeze. And then the coup de grace, with Vince McMahon swooping in, taking off his turtleneck and stealing the pin before downing a beer and dishing out the smack talk as a helpless Austin was held in the corner. A great closing segment and a big win for our man. Number 38 versus The Undertaker. Number 38 features one of the most feared and respected veterans in the sport, a battle-tested warrior who earned a formidable reputation inside the ring and became a leader in the locker room who sacrificed everything for wrestling fans over a span of decades, going one-on-one -on -one with The Undertaker. Yes, Vince McMahon and arguably his greatest character creation squared off on the May 31st, 1999 episode of Raw. I can't remember every minute detail, and I'm pretty sure the show was being written the morning of on ketchup packets at this point, but for some reason a babyface Vince had to beat Taker so that Steve Austin could get another shot at the WWE title. The Phenom dominated in the beginning, wearing Vinny down with strikes and a choke, before the resourceful and might I add handsome McMahon came back with a good old fashioned kick to the Michelle McCools. The advantage didn't last long and Taker continued the beating until he was disqualified for shoving the ref down one too many times. Again, this was an angle as much as an actual match, but it did its job well and the crowd response speaks for itself. Plus, how many times have we gotten to see Vince and Undertaker go at it like this? Keep watching this video to find out. Number 37 with Steve Austin in The Rock versus Shane McMahon, The Undertaker and Triple H. Oh well, that didn't take long as Vince and Taker are once again on opposite sides of the ring and for the hell of it, let's throw in The Rock, Steve Austin, Triple H and Shane O'Mac too. Oh, and Shawn Michaels is the guest referee because why the hell wouldn't he be? An absurd amount of star power, yes, and the novelty of seeing all of these guys in the same place at the same time is what carries this. Vince gets wrecked right at the beginning, taking a choke slam and a tombstone and getting strangled with a camera cable, taking him out of the match as a wild brawl erupts. He gets back into the ring for the finish, Steve Austin throwing Vince off of Shane to make sure that his mortal enemy doesn't get the win for himself. A frenzied conclusion to the show, this is the kind of excitement that WWE routinely created during this crazy era. Number 36 with Triple H and Shane McMahon versus The Undertaker, Kane and The Rock. A similarly star-studded extravaganza took place just over a year later on SmackDown. The show closer for the June 22, 2000 SmackDown, the go-home episode for the King of the Ring pay-per-view was to feature that show's main event in advance with Vince teaming with Triple H and Shane McMahon to take on The Rock and the Brothers of Destruction. Of course, anyone with half a clue would clock the fact that this match was never going to happen on free TV, so it came as no surprise when Vince got on the microphone and changed it to a handicap match, sending out DX members, Edge and Christian, Kurt Angle, Test and Albert, Val Venus, and Bull Bloody Buchanan to battle instead. The babyfaces did well against this gaggle of good but the numbers game was simply too much. The match slash angle culminated with Vince hitting the least elegant people's elbow in history on The Rock, picture an overstuffed bodybuilder with bad hips wading through treacle and scoring the pin. The final image of the broadcast was the heel squad holding victorious Vince aloft as the wonderful bastard imitated The Rock's signature expressions. Number 35 with Shane McMahon versus Eugene. In this countdown, we're going to see Vince McMahon in action with a little person and a man with one leg, so let's not feign shock at the boss pitting himself and his son against WWE's most, um, special superstar, Eugene. Poor Eugene incurred the wrath of the McMahons when he was found to be enjoying the sophomore antics of DX and was subsequently drenched in green paint and given a swirly before being booked in the no DQ handicap match main event. With the Spirit Squad stationed at ringside, Shane handled most of the work here, while Vince provided match commentary from the house mic on the apron. A brief comeback was extinguished by the male cheerleaders and just before Shane was about to hit Eugene with the big elbow through the announce table, Sean and Hunter bothered to show up. Vince tried to catch them in a giant net that fell from the ceiling, as all great cartoon villains should, the distraction allowing Eric Bischoff's nephew to score a quick schoolboy for the win. Those cheeky scamps had done it again and Vince looked like somebody had sneezed into his steak wrap. Number 34 versus Bobby Lashley. 
Six days before the Battle of the Billionaires at WrestleMania 23, Vince went one-on-one -on -one with Donald Trump's representative, Bobby Lashley. They had a competitive 12-minute match stuffed with false finishes until the Lasher avoided a moonsault and hit the spear for the win. Gotcha! No, this was your classic Vince McMahon makes the match no disqualifications and sends his goons to the ring to get pummeled a fair. On this occasion, it was up to Lance Cade, Trevor Murdoch, Chris Masters and Johnny Nitro to bounce around like pin balls before Umaga got the job done and Vince got to pin Lashley not once, but twice after he was done directing traffic. A great showcase for Lashley, a strong final angle heading into WrestleMania and two more big victories for the higher power. Number 33 versus Triple H Having recently had his name added to the Walk of Fame outside of Madison Square Garden, Vince stepped, well, power walked, into the world's most famous arena with extra vigor for his main event match with Triple H on the September 11th, 2006 episode of Raw. I mean, he was wearing a red vest instead of his usual black one, so it must have been a special night. Before the bout, the game and HBK were attacked backstage by Shane, Big Show, and Caden Murdoch. The foursome ran Triple H's head into a car window, and he turned up for the match with blood running down his neck, looking like he was fresh off the Blade Trinity set. The cerebral assassin was like chum in the water, as his father-in-law peppered him with slaps and punches and choked him with his belt, his cobra-like trap muscles threatening to burst at any moment. A trip to the ring post, followed by more kicks and punches, led to Vince hitting his own version of the pedigree, a surprisingly smooth one from someone who looks and moves like they're filled with cement. It didn't get the job done though, and Triple H made a comeback with punches and a spine buster, drawing Shane McMahon and Shawn Michaels out for more monkey shines until Big Show tipped the balance and the scales by the look of him here. Vince passed over a steel chair in favor of Triple H's own sledgehammer, a solid shot to the chops, adding yet another former world champion to the Mac Daddy's list of people he's beaten. Number 32 with Carlito versus Triple H. A year later, and Vince was still butting heads with the bloke he probably worried was going to oust him from the top of the McMahon family Thanksgiving table. This time out, he was teaming with Carlito in a steel cage handicap match where you could only win via escape, which was likely the only way that Vince was going to win here anyway. Highlights included Vince's sizable grapefruits being introduced to the top rope the hard way, and the back of his head being repeatedly rammed into the mesh. Triple H and Carlito naturally carried the action here, with Vince on hand to take some punishment, hoping to survive long enough to get the hell out of the ring. Which he was able to do, because he is an absolute specimen of a man with unparalleled climbing abilities, and Carlito was holding the game's leg, preventing him from scaling the cage himself. Gutted that he had once again come up short against a true alpha, Trips then took out his frustrations on the man from San Juan, beating him in the bollocks and splitting his head open before dropping him with a pedigree on a steel chair. Because the best baby faces are obviously the biggest crybaby sore losers. Number 31 with Shane McMahon versus the Dudley Boys. Vince's long-suffering wife Linda booked her husband and son in a tag team table match with the genre's finest practitioners, the Dudley Boys, on the June 12, 2000 edition of Raw. A sneak attack bought the McMahons a little bit of time, with Vince working away on Devon with some rabbit punches that made it painfully clear where Shane gets his striking skills from, but it wasn't long before the Wizards of the Wicked Wood were on the offensive. Vince was bounced off the announce table and sent flying into the steps as Shane got isolated in the ring. Once recovered, Vince decided to hop into the ring for more abuse, his notoriously enlarged grapefruits meeting Devon's face. Wait, that sounds dodgy. Let me clear that up and say that it was because of the professional wrestling double team maneuver, what up, and not whatever dirty, shameful thing you were thinking of. Shane took a 3D and it looked like the match was sewn up when DX ran in. In the excitement of it all, Vince and Bubba fell awkwardly from the turnbuckles to the floor, the head honcho hitting the ringside mat with the almighty thud of 240 pounds of chiseled beef doing the job to gravity. Things got even scarier as Tori nearly broke her neck failing to put Bubba through a table with a splash before nailing it on the second attempt and putting a bow on this entertainingly terrifying match. Sometimes you're just thankful everyone is able to leave with their bones in the right place. Number 30 versus Randy Orton Randy Orton spent a good portion of 2009 screwing with Triple H and the McMahon family. Like every accomplished psychopath, the Viper realized that the best way to get inside the head of his WrestleMania opponents was to hurt the ones he loved the most, and reveled in punting Shane and Vince in the head and dropping Stephanie with an RKO. 
Vince sought retribution the night after Orton had fallen to the Cerebral Assassin at WrestleMania 25, going one-on-one -on -one with the Legend Killer in the main event of Raw. The match is a good insight into the ego of the owner of the company as, even though young Randall was still selling a beating from the Mania showdown, Vince was presented as a super tough street fighter who easily battered his much younger former tormentor. Yes, Vinnie Mac looked like the toughest SOB on the geriatric ward as he laid in shots and talked trash until Orton turned the tide and leveled the promoter with an RKO. It was almost time for Punt Part 2, Shane McMahon getting there just in time to save some more of Pop's brain cells. Cue Legacy and Triple H for a big brawl, which was capped off with the surprise and welcome return of Batista. Number 29 versus Ric Flair On the November 26, 2007 Raw, Vince McMahon informed Ric Flair that his career would come to an end the first time that he lost a match from that moment on. A captivating storyline to see the Nature Boy through to the end of an incredible run, it's also led to a match between the pair four months later when McMahon became annoyed that nobody had managed to get a pin or submission on the 16-time world champion. Flair and McMahon had a few matches on WWE television and this one, while the weakest of the Bunch is still a good bit of fun, especially if you like seeing senior citizens smacking each other in the face. Slick Rick bled, as he often, alright, almost always does, and Vince tried to send him to the farm by cracking him with a ringside monitor, a bin, a kendo stick, and a steel chair. The dirtiest player in the game, having scouted his opponent and being aware of the size of Vince's grapefruits, naturally targeted that special area in order to make a comeback, hitting him with two nut shots before driving the man who signs his checks through a table with a splash. Flair's career continued until WrestleMania and Vince got walloped in the slammies. All's well that ends well, I say. Number 28 versus John Cena. The Chairman versus the Champion. Vince clashed with his newest money-making megastar on the Raw before WrestleMania 22, and he did so sporting a tan that makes Hulk Hogan look like Sheamus. Mr. McMahon, who had just graced the cover of Muscle and Fitness magazine, was so pumped up and looked like he'd just walked to the ring fresh off the front page. After a quick jog around the ring to warm up, Vince got on the stick and demanded that both Shawn Michaels and Triple H be handcuffed to the ring posts so that they couldn't get involved. As for the match, it was quite the spectacle. Two vascular titans testing their strength and doing everything in their power not to take a proper bump. It was like the 1980s all over again. Honestly, they did practically nothing, but it was somehow entertaining, thanks in large part to Vince's facial expressions. A low blow gave Cena the W via DQ before Vince revealed that it was a setup all along, Kel surprise, and uncuffed his daughter's husband so the drubbing could commence. It was shorts, it was predictable, but it was John Cena facing off with Vince McMahon, something that thankfully only happened once. Number 27 with Kurt Angle vs Triple H and Ric Flair the last episode of WWE television before the brand extension came into effect saw something of a dream tag team match main event go down. Vince was the general manager of SmackDown while Flair was the GM of Raw and they picked a couple of studs to partner up with as they did battle one more time before they had to actually focus on running their shows. Vince and Tripp started with some fine posing, a Mr. McMahon match special, before both quickly tagged out to Flair and Angle, a match that, had they met while each was in their prime, could have been one of the best ever. Kurt did most of the early work before tagging into McMahon, looking tanned and ripped and every bit like a man who legitimately owns a big yacht called the Sexy Bitch. Our man worked the knee and generally moved and acted like a pantomime baddie, trying to lock in a figure four on the master before getting his chest lit up like a Christmas tree with knife edge chops. McMahon did eventually get to put on the figure four, but Flair made his escape and the hot tagged his future evolution buddy, who tried to nail the Olympian with a pedigree, broken up by Vince decking him in the head with the game's own WWE title. Vince did a comical strut and then promptly had his well quaffed head taken off with a Triple H clothesline and a Ric Flair chop from the top rope. Do not adjust your sets, folks. The Nature Boy actually hit an offensive move from the top rope. Woo! More chops and punches and kicks to the ding dong, and then Flair looked to have it won with the figure four when The Undertaker showed up and blasted him with a big boot, allowing Vince to roll on top for the one, two, three. Number 26 versus Bret Hart. 
By rights, a WrestleMania grudge match between Bret Hart and Vince McMahon should crack the top 10 here, if not the top 5. Almost 13 years in the making, their meeting had genuine emotion and blended fact with fiction with ease. Bret had obvious resentment towards his former boss, stemming from the Montreal screw job, while Vince had always maintained that it was something he simply had to do to protect his company during the Monday Night Wars. Whichever side you agreed with, and it should really be Bret's, it made for compelling drama and the novelty of seeing the hitman in a WWE ring for the first time since the 1997 Survivor Series was enough to pique the curiosity of even the most jaded of lapsed fans. Come 2010, however, Vince was in his mid-60s and Brett's physical contact was limited due to health issues he had suffered years earlier. What could have been a dynamic brawl turned out to be a long, brutal slog where the detestable McMahon was beaten so badly that he almost became sympathetic. While definitely a special attraction, this match didn't really need to happen, apart from to give some closure to Brett. Fair play to Vince for taking his medicine mind, I'd have probably cried uncle after the 18th time I've been smacked with a chair. Number 25 versus Hornswoggle. Now this is more like it. On the February 11th, 2008 Raw, Vince McMahon finally got to wrestle a little person dressed as a leprechaun, something that fans had been craving to see since the boss first stepped into the ring a decade prior. Okay, fans might be stretching it a little bit, I meant me, but don't act like you weren't just as curious as I was when this thing was announced. This all stemmed from the reveal that Hornswoggle was Vince's son, a role originally earmarked for Mr. Kennedy, Kennedy, until real life got in the way. Obviously, a 60-something Vince and a man with the dimensions of old horny wasn't going to threaten the Meltzer star scale, and the match was really an angle. The stipulation was no DQ, but McMahon had said that anyone interfering would be fired. Vince pushed his son and mocked him profusely, and looked like he had a great time doing it, before Finley ran in as Vince took off his belt and threatened to take one of WWE's favourite punchlines to the woodshed. A shillelagh shot and a tadpole splash later, and Vince was handed a rare and extra humiliating loss. Number 24 versus Eric Bischoff Hell froze over on the July 15th, 2002 episode of Raw when Eric Bischoff, former EVP of WCW and the man intent on running Vince McMahon out of business, was revealed to be the new general manager of the show, complete with embracing his former competitor in a sight akin to aliens shaking hands with the president or Nia Jax going a week without injuring someone. It was inevitable that these two would clash heads somewhere down the line, but the surprise was that it took them almost two years to do it, and that the match aired on free television, not pay-per-view. The Bish and Vince got a chance to get all of that pent-up aggression out on the February 23rd, 2004 Raw, with Steve Austin, doubtless to be impartial and not give anyone a stone-cold stunner, on hand as the referee. This was as scrappy as two blokes brawling outside of a dodgy nightclub after last orders, not a lot of finesse being displayed as they punched and kicked and chased each other around the ring. The match ended, abruptly, as Vince was choking Bischoff on the outside and SmackDown's Brock Lesnar ran in and gave Austin an F5 as a way to advance the next big thing's feud with Goldberg. Not a great match, duh, but it was heated and let's be honest, not something that would have seemed possible even a few short years prior. Number 23, the 1999 Royal Rumble match. Taken as a whole and viewed out of context, the 1999 Royal Rumble match is probably one of the weakest rumbles ever. When the field includes such luminaries as Golga, Gilberg, Kurgan, Tiger Ali Singh and Mabel, you know you're not likely to find much thrilling in-ring action, which was pretty low on the Attitude Era priority list, let's be honest. No, this match is about one thing and one thing only, the continuation of the McMahon vs Austin feud. Drawing numbers 1 and 2, they had their moment right at the start of the match, and then brawled through the crowd and into the backstage area, where Austin was duly attacked by members of the corporation. The match rolled on as Vince returned to provide commentary, and Austin was seen to by medical personnel. Obviously, the hard-as-nails Texas rattlesnake wasn't going to the hospital, or should I say local medical facility, so he drove the ambulance back to the arena himself and returned to the task at hand, namely getting his shots in on the owner while trying to win the match and go to WrestleMania. The match came down to the two men who had started it, and Vince was just excellent here, getting the baby oil beaten clean off his well-sculpted body until a distraction courtesy of The Rock enabled Vince to sneak up behind his adversary and dump him out, winning the match. Tedious and plodding without knowing the storylines going into the match? Perhaps. But as a showcase for the Vince and Austin rivalry, it is pure sports entertainment silliness at its finest. 
Number 22 versus Ric Flair. The second McMahon versus Flair singles match on our countdown, this one was the main event of the June 10th, 2002 Raw, and the two general managers were throwing down with no holds barred and the ownership of the company on the line. Flair has since admitted that he was suffering from a crisis of confidence around this time and wasn't so much a kiss stealing, wheeling dealing, limousine riding, jet flying son of a gun as a hug giving, bus taking, economy class sitting bloke who didn't seem to realise that he was one of the greatest of all time. All things considered, this went about as well as could be expected, and Vince and Flair engaged in a big arena-wide brawl which saw Vince channel his inner Mick Foley and take a slam on the concrete floor. Vince took over with an eye rake and a ring bell shot to the skull that split the nature boy open. Sounds cool, but not exactly an accomplishment when the same usually happens if there's a light summer breeze, such as the thinness of the skin on Flair's forehead. The assault continued with kicks, punches, clotheslines, and a vintage boot straight to Space Mountain. The decision to bring in a chair backfired and Flair got in his own shot to the nuts. It's called storytelling, folks. Look it up. Locking in the figure four as Arn Anderson played cheerleader. Arn Anderson in a cheerleader's outfit. Now there is a visual that will ruin your day. Speaking of ruining days, Brock Lesnar prevented the tap out by hitting Flair with an F5, which was more than enough to give another big win and control of the company back to the big cheese. Number 21 versus Triple H. Are you telling me this is an actual match? Ask colour commentator Jerry Lawler ahead of the WWE title bout between Triple H and Vince McMahon on the September 16th, 1999 Smackers. Yes, it is, Jerry, you pest, because the game made it so and even picked Vince's other and overwhelmingly least favourite son as the referee. McMahon was goaded into the match after Trips questioned the size of his knackers and insinuated that he was going to have sexual relations with his future mother-in-law. You can always count on wrestling for a bit of light, fluffy family entertainment. Entertainment, eh? Competing in his slacks and shirt, Vince got his shots in, but this was one-sided, as it should have been, and Triple H did a great job of dismantling him, throwing him into the steps, choking him with a cable, and putting him through the announce table with an elbow drop, landing square on Vince's cold, black heart. A chair came into play, enough to bring out the Stooges and Linda to try and put an end to the slaughter, but it was only the intervention of Stone Cold Steve Austin that levelled things up. One stunner later, and Vince was WWE Champion and not a moment too soon, if you ask me. <laughs> Number 20 with Shane McMahon and Umaga versus Bobby Lashley. The whole point of this handicap match from Backlash 2007 was to create a desire to see Bobby Lashley finally get his hands on Vince McMahon at a later date, where you would pay for the privilege, of course. The two didn't touch here and most of the action was carried by Umaga and Shane, so it can hardly go down as a brilliant performance by the freshly bald boss. This was all about the powerhouse attempting to overcome the odds and somehow walk out still ECW champion. That was not to be on this night, as the Samoan Bulldozer and Super Shane did the business in what was an entertaining match, a couple of giant splashes from Umaga enough to net Vince the ECW title. Vince McMahon, ECW champion. Tommy Dreamer didn't almost die for this. Number 19 with Triple H and Shane McMahon versus The Undertaker, Kane and The Rock. On to 19 now, and though it's by no means the best Vince McMahon performance or even a great match, this six-man WWE title tag match from the 2000 King of the Ring is a lot of fun and gets by on pure star power alone. And how interesting is it to see that a major singles title being on the line in a multi-man tag wasn't a TNA idea? Doesn't make it a good one though, mind you. It is psychologically quite interesting though, as The Rock had to work against his own team in a bid to reclaim the title he had lost the previous month at Judgment Day. Vince's involvement is almost non-existent here, but he is involved in the finish, going for that people's elbow once again, but getting caught with a rock bottom, losing the match for a furious Triple H, as Shane took a nap at ringside after suffering a breathtaking chokeslam from the top turnbuckle through the announce table. Ouch. Number 18 versus Shane McMahon. Speaking of the boy wonder, Shane and his Mac Daddy were once again at loggerheads in the main event of the October 29th, 2001 Raw. Shane and Stephanie had by this point betrayed their old man by bringing about the WCW and ECW invasion of WWE. Vince, probably furious that Shane ever thought the likes of Sean Stasiak, Mark Jindrak and the lot had a chance in hell of unseating the emperor of the wrestling universe, decided to batter his son in a street fight. Vince 
This was the aggressor peppering Shane with punches and trying to murder him by wrapping a television cable around his throat. Fathers and sons, what are they like, eh? Shane avoided suffocation and came back with a low blow, some shots with one of those big metal bins that I could never find in B&Q, and Mr. Shooting Star Press landing kidney first on the, now let me check my WWE approved list of terms here, ah yes, landed kidney first on a trash receptacle. Vince dished out some stinging kendo stick shots, but ended up being put through the announce desk via Shane's beautiful big elbow. The coast to coast would have ended it, but Vince managed to counter by sort of falling over and pushing the trash receptacle into Shane's knees, bringing out members of the Alliance and Team WWE for some finisher trading, climaxing with a Kurt Angle heel turn, and Austin hitting Vince with the worst stunner this side of Mr. Cena's absurd springboard thingy. A good main event and a worthy follow-up to their WrestleMania match. Now, now, if you'll excuse me for a second, I'm off to hit my dad with a shooting star press. Number 17 with The Rock versus Big Show and Shane McMahon. Number 17 on our countdown was something of a precursor to the WrestleMania 16 main event, where a McMahon would be in every corner. Just like my cardboard cutout filled bedroom. Vince teamed with his man, The Rock, to take on Shane and his pick, The Big Show, with Triple H and Mick Foley on hand as special guest referees. And you know what? Even though it was overbooked six ways from Sunday, it was a good match. The Rock, who at this point was the most over wrestler on the planet, did much of the work and the crowd was super hot throughout, especially when Vince begged for the talent so he could once again engage in some good old-fashioned but sanctioned child abuse. Vince beat on his son like he owed him a decade's worth of birthday cards, throwing him into the ring steps and smashing his face into the announce desk. Unsurprisingly, the officials got involved and Vince ended up trading potatoes with Triple H, with the Great One getting the pin on Shane in amongst the chaos. If you're watching on the network, there's some extra attitude to be found, a post-match previously untelevised segment where Vince Foley and The Rock all hit Shane with their version of the people's elbow. No prizes for guessing which one looks like Mr. Blobby trying to roll a blade on ice. Number 16 versus Bobby Lashley. After weeks of trying to get his hands on Vince in a one-on-one -on -one match, Lashley finally got his wish when the two met at One Night Stand 2007. Only it wouldn't be one-on-one, -on -one, would it, you mug? Because this was a street fight and Vince brought along Umaga and his idiot son as backup. Big Bad Bob, sensing he really needed to take out the heavies early, launched himself at the Samoan Bulldozer at the sound of the opening bell, sailing over the top rope and missing his target by a good two feet. But it's nice to try these sorts of things, right? He then press slammed Shane over the top onto Umaga and was finally free to get his shots in on Vince. The numbers game would soon serve its purpose, Lashley getting worn down with a three-on-one assault. Vince, the ECW world champion lest we forget, tried to end it with Lashley's own spear, but it wasn't enough and he made a comeback by moving out of the way of an Umaga splash, putting Vince in his place to take the blow. Lashley was nice and fired up and got rid of Shane and Umaga again before making Vince eat a chair, followed by a running power slam. Once again though, the numbers game caught up with him and he was put through the announce table with Shane's always impressive flying elbow. The coast to coast backfired as Umaga ate the trash receptacle and a spear apiece on Vince and son meant that the Dominator walked out as the new ECW champion. Number 15 with Kurt Angle versus The Rock and Trish Stratus. Right, so we may as well address the elephant in the room and discuss what I'm sure many of you heathens clicked on this video to see. Vince McMahon's ass. So, after the invasion was over and Vince had vanquished the terrifying force of Sean Stasiak, Mark Jindrak and the lot, he began to flout his power more than ever, introducing the world to the Vince McMahon Kiss My Ass Club and quickly inducting William Regal and Jim Ross as members. This all led to this match here, where if Kurt and Vince won, then The Rock would have to pucker up, but if Rock and Trish won, Vince would have to plant a wet one on the Great One's candy you-know-what. You know, just thinking about this, I can hear my mum asking, why the hell do you watch this crap, Adam? Put the remote down and go and make some real friends. Anyway, before the match had even started, Vince made it a winner by doing one of the single funniest dances I have ever seen for the benefit of Trish. The early stages were all rock and angle and the action was good, and then Vince tagged in to get his punches, big clothesline, a choke, and a low blow in. He pie-faced Trish off the apron like the despicable dick that he is, and paid for it with a spine buster as rock tagged in can 
Canada's greatest export. Trish mounted Vince and hit him with punches and slaps as JR yelled, Trish is on top and she's giving it to Vince! And I swear this isn't some sort of sordid fan fiction I found in the depths of Reddit. She got in her own low blow and then Angle came in and hit her from behind because he is also a despicable dick. A despicable dick with a broken freaking neck. Eventually the ref was bumped and Chris Jericho ran in and hit a lion salt on Rocky for a great false finish. Vince then chased Trish up the ramp only to be met by Stone Cold Steve Austin and from there the result was inevitable. Vince's reaction as he realizes just what the loss actually means is another all-timer. Number 14 with Shane McMahon versus Steve Austin. Vince McMahon versus Steve Austin is a formula that has always and will always work. Throw in Shane McMahon, ladders and a stipulation with control of the company on the line and it works even more. Before their handicap ladder match at the 1999 King of the Ring, Shane tried to feign an injury and Vince almost replaced him with Steve Blackman before Commissioner Shawn Michaels foiled the ruse. This brief detour only served to piss Austin off even more and the Texas Rattlesnake spent the the early going positively leathering man and boy. To be honest, that's basically the story of this match, with Austin reveling in the novel ways in which he could use the ladders, including the stage set which was comprised of a convoluted structure made of things to punish his opponents. Never one to go higher than the second rope, Austin even jumped off a ladder to put Shane through the announce table and took an awkward bump off a ladder onto the other desk. Austin came back and made a McMahon sandwich with a ladder filling and looked to have everything under control as he continued his little spree. In a funny moment, Vince tried to boost Shane up to grab the briefcase suspended above the ring, which failed in predictably hilarious style. A couple of stunners had the match won, but then the briefcase began mysteriously moving out of Austin's reach, enabling the opportunistic Shane to snatch it. Edge and Christian and the Hardys this ain't. A totally different kind of ladder match, this is wacky cartoonish fun with a hot crowd and an inventive finish. We never found out who the person pulling the strings actually was, by the way, but not a day goes by that I don't think about it. Number 13 versus Stephanie McMahon Unlucky for some, number 13 is what is billed as the first ever father-daughter I quit match. What, you mean we haven't had a sequel yet? Someone get Rick and Charlotte on the phone right now. A natural matchup after Vince had feuded with his son, wife, and son-in-law, this clash of the McMahons came about as a result of Vince's relationship with Sable. Showing up for the match with his skin tanned and tighter than ever against a body that could barely be more muscular, Vince looked like a condom stuffed with walnuts as he swaggered into the ring to try and get his descendant to give up. Attacking Steph from behind as he chastised Linda, who was accompanying her poor daughter, Vince set the tone from the off and continued to make everyone uncomfortable by throwing her around by her hair and kneeing her in the midsection. And I'm sorry, but Vince catching his daughter's kick and almost taking her head off with a clothesline is worth 50 of your Okada Omegas. This was just a purely awful and awfully entertaining spectacle. Vince hamming it up to an absurd degree as he locked in a half crab and chin lock, providing expressions he must have learned from watching bad Nicolas Cage films on late night TV. Linda and Sable got into it on the floor, forcing Vince to intercede, Linda slapping her husband in the face, and Stephanie following up with a low blow and many shots with a lead pipe. But then Big Daddy Vince got the pipe and it was game over as he tried to to choke the life out of Mrs. Triple H, Steph only being spared as Linda threw in the towel to stop the match. All right, let's just go ahead and say it. This was ridiculous. A match that probably shouldn't have happened, but did and was every bit the crazy McMahon circus you would have wanted. Vince throwing down Linda and locking lips with Sable after the match was just mwah. Number 12 versus The Undertaker One month after the televised beating of his daughter, Vince was to face his maker in a Buried Alive match at Survivor Series. Vinnie Mac had screwed Big Evil out of the WWE title in the main event of No Mercy and believed going into their showdown that a higher power was watching over him. Wait, I thought Vince was the higher power, or am I, uh? Anyway, the match, taking place as Undertaker celebrated 13 years on his opponent's payroll, not with a cake, but by dismantling McMahon for 10 full glorious minutes. This was about as one-sided as a match can get, with Taker busting Vince open with the first punch thrown in the match, a sickening amount of claret covering his face as he was punched and kicked and choked and had his precious grapefruits forcefully introduced into the ring post. 
twice. Really, if you ever feel mad about a WWE storyline or a creative decision or firing or whatever, stick this one on and bring plenty of popcorn. Vince was whacked in the face with a shovel, had his ankle pilmanized on the steel steps, and would have surely taken a dirt nap were it not for Kane and a timely fireball to undertake his face. Mr. McMahon may have lost two pints of the red stuff and had his bollocks turn a new shade of purple, but he was a winner, damn it. Not a match so much as a slaughter with a screwy finish, but hella entertaining. Number 11 versus Zach Gowan. Another one from 2003, and Vince was on quite the roll that year, wasn't he? He forced his daughter to quit the company, buried The Undertaker alive, and also got to face a one legged man in an ass kicking contest when he faced Zach Gowan at Vengeance. The two met because Gowan had come to the aid of Mr. America slash Hulk Hogan. With Terrible Terry taking some time away after a contractual dispute, McMahon turned his attention to his amputated ally. The story and segments leading into this were, of course, in terribly poor taste, but the match is a triumph and showed what a ring general Vince could actually be. I'm not suggesting he's Daniel Bryan or anything, but he held everything together well and did his utmost to help Gowan shine, taking all of his unique offense brilliantly. McMahon obviously obviously worked the leg for much of the match and used his size advantage to slam young Zack around in a bid to prevent a comeback. Gowan did manage to muster up an impressive response, hitting top rope drop kicks and a moonsault and kicking a chair into McMahon's face, busting him open the hard way. A missed twisting moonsault proved his undoing and Vince walked away the winner, but the crowd gave Gowan a deserved standing ovation afterwards in a nice moment. Zach Gowan wasn't around for long and this isn't the most famous Vince McMahon feud by any means, but it is really good for what it was and Vince made the situation work in a way that others simply wouldn't be able to. Number 10 versus Triple H. Into the top 10 now, and another singles match with Triple H, right around the time that the game became a bona fide top guy. Coincidence? I think not. Vince and his future son-in-law were the main event of Armageddon 1999 after Triple H had supposedly drugged and married an unconscious Stephanie at a Las Vegas drive-in. Again, don't you just love the light escapism that professional wrestling provides? The stipulation of this street fight was that if the cerebral assassin won, that he would get to stay married to Stephanie and would receive a future WWE title shot. If Vince won, then the marriage would be annulled and Triple H would have to change his name to Holly Hunter Helmsley and marry Shawn Michaels instead. Dead. Okay, I might have made that last part up. There was a lot of hate going into this match, and appropriately enough, most of the near 30 minute duration of the contest was spent with the men belting each other in the head with inanimate objects, many of which were given to them by Mick Foley and his extreme shopping trolley. Honestly, the match goes on forever, and it's entertaining enough, especially if you like seeing alpha males engage in a concussion contest, but it does get a little farcical at times, even for a Vince McMahon match. Let that one sink in for a moment. After a quick excursion backstage and then outside of the arena, they make their way back in for Vince to fall off the stage set. The billion dollar princess, who was watching from the front row, gets involved and Triple H finally gets the win after bashing a bloody Vince with his trusty sledgehammer. And then for the big reveal, as it turns out it was a setup all along, and Triple H and Stephanie were in cahoots the whole time, embracing one another to signal the start of the McMahon Helmsley era. Number 9 with Shane McMahon versus Shawn Michaels and God. Number 9 and Vince is taking on his most powerful foe yet. No, I'm not talking about Shawn Michaels, but rather HBK's best mate, God. In the aftermath of their wildly entertaining WrestleMania match, more on that soon enough, Vince tried to get under Shawn's skin by going after his faith, which gave us some incredible skits and Vince inventing his own religion called McMahonism. Never afraid to court controversy, Vince booked himself and Shane in a tag match with Michaels and the Supreme Being, who made an appearance as a lone spotlight edging towards the ring. If you want anyone out there with two non-wrestlers, it's probably Michaels, who is one of the best to ever do it, and could ensure the wheels don't fall off while the train is in motion. That was his role here, and he did an amazing job getting a very entertaining match out of McMahon Sr. and Jr. He hit a plancher apiece on them, brawled up to the stage, and knocked Vince off with a diving crossbody in a wild visual. Shane, the hardest man in the world in case you didn't know, took over with a chair shot and then Vince came back to take a bloody Michaels to the woodshed and then clock him with a trash receptacle. Michaels made his comeback and Shane accidentally cracked his pops in the dome with a chair, setting up sweet chin musics, plural. 
With the McMahons out cold, Sean went for the big elbow through a pair of tables, but the Spirit Squad arrived to ruin the party and put the showstopper through the wood instead, giving Vince the victory and bragging rights over the big lad in the sky. Number 8 vs CM Punk Number 8 and a sad moment as we mark the occasion of the last, at least to this point, Mr. McMahon match. I'm not sure whether we should observe a moment of silence or eat a tub of protein powder, so I'll just crack on with the bantering and the rancoring. Vince and Punk had a war of words that turned physical on the October 8th, 2012 Raw, setting up their No DQ main event match. He may have been older, but the biceps were still popping and the will to entertain was still very much there. Punk attacked during the entrance and beat him down, but Vince came back to easily take Punk down with a double leg, a harbinger of the best in the world's MMA career. Punk kicked Vince in the head and began to ram his opponent into the announce desk, only stopping to nick Michael Cole's headset and call the action in classic Vince McMahon style. What a maneuver! Our man retaliated by shoving Punk into the ring post and then hurling him over the announce desk before throwing himself over it and laying in the punches and then going for a kendo stick. The straight edge superstar retreated but came back after Vince decked Paul Heyman and stole the WWE title. I mean, he does own it to be fair to him. A kendo stick battle brought the arena to its feet, Punk regaining control with a low blow and setting up the GTS when Ryback and then John Cena got off the bench press for long enough to chase him off once and for all. Personally, I'd have put the title on Vince here, but besides that oversight, this was a cracking bit of television and a great way for Vince to sign off his in-ring career. Sorry, I think I've got something in my eye. Number 7 with Shane McMahon vs DX all of the aggro with the McMahons led to Shawn Michaels teaming up with Triple H, reforming DX and subjecting us to months of dick and fart jokes and a series of bonkers matches with Vince and Shane. Stacking the odds against our boys in green and black, the McMahons sent out the Spirit Squad, easily dispatched, Ken Kennedy, William Regal and Finley, do a little better but still nope, and finally the Big Show, that'll do it, putting the game through the announce table so that the heartbreak kid could be isolated. Vince and Shane took turns here and threw in a couple of routine double teams, like a double super that looked like something that would get you thrown out of wrestling school on your first day, before reaching into the classic tag team move playbook to nick some effective finishers from years gone by. A demolition elbow, heart attack, and a doomsday device couldn't see him off, and DX made their comeback. Umaga came out and was met by Kane, because you have to fight a monster with a monster, and a sweet chin music and pedigree sealed the deal for our frat house heroes. Way overbooked, perhaps even for Vince Russo, this is the goofy nonsense that the McMahons accept at and helped brighten an otherwise so-so card. Number 6 vs Ric Flair the third Ric Flair vs Vince McMahon match on the list, this was the first meeting between the pair and was also the Nature Boy's first WWE match since 1993. Flair had returned in the wake of the invasion as the co-owner of WWE. It didn't take long for the two to set up a match and there was no better place than the Royal Rumble, which just so happened to take place in the former WCW stronghold of Atlanta, Georgia. Both men looked the business as they stood face to face at the beginning of this historic confrontation and, before you could say, woo, the fight was on. Vince overpowered Flair early on, pushing him to the ground and busting out one of his pitch-perfect facial expressions as he flexed. A giant shoulder block and another bodybuilding pose, and I'll tell you right now, I could watch this all day. McMahon continued by mocking Flair, but soon the tide turned and the big chops came out, smacking Vince on that hot dog-coloured leather handbag that he calls a chest. Flair took a big bump off the apron as Vince started to dominate as the street fight rules came into play, Vince smacking him with a sign and whipping him into the steel barrel arcade in the aisle. Slick Rick was bloodied, obviously, set into the post and slammed on the floor as Vince taunted him in front of Flair's own family, who was sitting in the front row. McMahon then began working Flair's legs, setting up the figure four, which Flair escaped from long enough to whack his storyline business partner in the Titan Towers. You know what, I reckon you might have got good odds on a low blow showing up in a match between Flair and Vince. After that, it was time to go to school, Flair taking over by hitting Vince in the head with a monitor, busting his foe open, and then laying in the chops and punches. One figure four later, and that was all she wrote. As a match, this was super simple, but very effective and served as a great launching pad for Flair's eventual in-ring comeback. The crowd were hot for it, and Vince seemed to be giving it all he had.
Number 5 versus Stone Cold Steve Austin The natural result of a year's worth of shenanigans, Steve Austin finally got his match with Vince McMahon inside a steel cage, live as the main event of the St. Valentine's Day Massacre pay-per-view. Austin was putting his WrestleMania title shot on the line in order to get his hands on the Wile E. Coyote to his Roadrunner, the cage stipulation there in order to make sure that no members of the corporation interfered on the boss's behalf. Vince spent the first bit of the match stalling and trying to avoid getting into the cage, to face the Texas Rattlesnake, it took Austin to fake a knee injury on the outside to get Vince to come out and confront him. After luring him in, the beatdown was on, and Austin looked to be having the time of his life as he realized he was being paid a large sum of money to stomp a mud hole in the CEO, both around the ringside area and amongst the fans. In an attempt to survive, Vince climbed up the side of the cage, and that went about as well as anyone could reasonably expect. The upshot was that McMahon flew off of it and crashed through the announce table, almost shattering his jacksie in the process. Out came the stretcher and the EMTs as it looked like Vince's night was over. However, as Austin quite rightly pointed out, he was still breathing, and thus, there was no reason the match couldn't continue. So it was back for more punishment, proving that he doesn't know to quit when he's ahead, not that he was ahead here by any stretch of the imagination, Vince began flipping Austin off as Stone Cold made his way out of the cage. That earned him yet more lumps as the cage busted him open, but Vince continued to taunt him, even with a face covered in crimson and a potentially broken backside. So it was back in once again for more punishment, as Vince did his best crash test dummy impression. The inevitable stunner blew the roof off when, who's that? Is that my Uncle Pete, who's not really my uncle, but is actually just a mate of my dad, who sometimes comes over to the house to drink beer and tell me to take a shave? No, it was WCW's The Giant tearing through the canvas and popping up like a big blonde gopher. The interference backfired when The Giant, excuse me, Paul White, threw him through the cage, both of Austin's feet touching the floor, putting an end to a very entertaining match and providing one of WWE's biggest, literally, stars a debut for the ages. Number 4 with Big Show and Shane McMahon vs DX Number 4 and it's another big blow-off match inside a cage and look, there's Big Show again, smugly holding the ECW title and looking for all the world like a knackered pork scratching. And there's Shane, and Triple H, and Shawn Michaels. The gang's all here and they're ready to destroy each other for our entertainment in the new super mega Hell in a Cell structure. After giving show the old double kick to the Paul Whites, those DX scamps set to work giving a bleeding good hiding to Vince and Shane, both of whom were lacerated within minutes. Show recovered and managed to get some offense in before he was dispatched once more and DX could carry on with the kicking. Eventually, show would be able to turn things around and prove to be the difference, hitting a chokeslam on the game and then busting open Shawn Michaels. Soon enough, Triple H was also cut open thanks to Shane McMahon going coast to coast with a trash receptacle, as Vince did a lot of standing around, smirking and instructing his minions how to best harm their opponents. Oh, and he also pulled his pants down because no major grudge match is complete without seeing a little bit of Vince ass, or in this case, his whole ass, his bare ass. A comeback was never far away though, and those pesky pranksters got back into it long enough to hit their usual before the pièce de résistance, pulling down Big Show's tights and shoving Vince McMahon's face into the world's largest backside. Now, usually I would question the hygiene involved with a stunt like that. After all, the owner had an open wound and it was going to be placed in an ungodly orifice. But at this stage, I have watched almost every Vince McMahon match ever, have slowly lost my grip on reality, and I'm only three matches away from ending this testosterone and toilet humor fueled fever dream. So actually, the spot was fine. A sweet chin music and a sledgehammer to the back, and Vince McMahon was dead. Let's move on. Number three versus Shawn Michaels. It would be hard to top the all-out wackiness of the previous match, but Vince and Shawn Michaels certainly didn't hold back when they met at WrestleMania 22. Mr. WrestleMania against Mr. McMahon, a genuine dream match many, many years in the making. Sensing the grandness of the occasion, it looked like Vince was even perkier than usual. There was an extra bit of pep in that infamous strut and the facials were turned up to 11. He even posed next to a framed photo of his Muscle and Fitness magazine cover. Staying true to one of the oldest rules in wrestling, that picture promptly found itself wrapped around McMahon's head. Cue the Spirit Squad, a group about as useful as a chocolate teapot who were readily taken care of. 
Though they didn't do anything worthwhile, the distraction did allow Vince to take over and begin working over Michaels, whipping and choking him with his leather belt. HBK rallied and gave his employer a taste of his own medicine, but Shane and a kendo stick prevented Sweet Chin music. An attempt to induct Michaels into a special club backfired tremendously, as Shane was forced to experience something I can only assume he still goes to therapy for. Adding insult to injury, the boy wonder was then handcuffed to the ropes and caned before Michaels almost removed Vince's head with a chair shot that would make the ECW roster blush, nearly took his teeth out with a ladder to the face, and finally ended McMahon's misery with an elbow off a giant ladder through a table. Vince, of course, had a trash receptacle on his bonce at the time. Oh no, wait, we can't forget the sweet chin music. There you go, now he's dead. A beautiful escalation of outrageous violence, this is definitive proof that Vince McMahon will go to any lengths to entertain his audience. The middle finger salute as he was being stretched backstage was a winner, even if Vince certainly wasn't. Number 2 versus Shane McMahon how brave of Vince to not only go up against his son, but also, let's not forget, the best wrestler in the entire world. Okay, so he didn't officially become the best wrestler in the world until many years later, but Shano was still pretty handy back in 2001 and was full of piss and vinegar and wanted to take down his pops for the terrible treatment of his mother Linda. Personally, I think he was just jealous that he didn't get to grotesquely make out with Trish Stratus, but that's just me. You know the deal here, Vince is evil, it's a street fight, Steph is in her dad's corner, and Mick Foley is acting as special guest ref. The Freudian psychodrama played out in front of a packed Houston Astrodome and features all of the bells and whistles and smoke and mirrors you would want in a match featuring all of these larger than life personalities. There was the big elbow through the announce table, which missed. Trish Stratus wheeled out a sedated Linda to watch the mayhem, and then the WWE Hall of Famer turned on her former squeeze and ran the billion dollar princess off. And of course, Vince gave Foley another concussion for old time's sake. In an amazing moment, Linda got a road warrior pop for rising out of her seat and booting Vince right in the genetic jackhammer. A bit of Foley revenge and a coast to coast later, and Vince was a broken and defeated man. A very rich and handsome, and probably clinically insane man, but a broken and defeated man nonetheless. A classic blow off match on one of the best pay per views ever, this had many magical moments and a crowd reaction that only Vince, Shane, myself, and a select few others ever get to experience. Number 1 versus Hulk Hogan Here it is, the best Vince McMahon match ever, and how appropriate that it would take place on and against two of his greatest creations, versus Hulk Hogan at WrestleMania. Hulkster was the early aggressor, wailing on Vince like he'd released an incriminating audio tape, before the boss used his street fight savvy to gain control of the contest and work over Hogan's left python. Vince missed a crucial chair shot to old Terry's Fu Manchu face and ended up eating some steel himself, getting busted open in the process. In a quite frankly hilarious moment, Vince ducked one of Hogan's wild swings, and the steel ended up connecting with Hugo Savinovich from the Spanish announce team. And it wasn't too long before Hugo's precious table was destroyed too, thanks to a Vince McMahon leg drop off a ladder. By this point, Vince, Hogan, and even Hugo Savinovich were busted open, but McMahon wasn't done yet, going out to get a lead pipe from under the ring and gifting us one of the best visuals in pro wrestling history. Hogan went low to stop the attack, but then Roddy Piper, making his first WWE appearance in seven years, wandered into the ring to a thundering ovation. It was thundering in paradise, you could say. <laughs> or not. After taking forever to decide who he was going to pipe, Rowdy Roddy chose the lesser of the two evils, debatable, I know, and creamed Hogan. That and another mocking leg drop didn't put the immortal one away though, as the red and yellow goblin hulked up, disposed of crooked referee Sylvain Grognier, and dropped his own leg for the win. Brother! And that is that. Every Vince McMahon match ranked from worst to best. Don't even think about ever asking for anything from me ever again. I'm going for a lie down. <laughs>